this evening. Um, I'm uh, Lisa Didion. I am an assistant professor here at the University of Iowa in the College of Ed, specifically in special education. I decided to um, offer this session and work with the TLC after some of my students in my explicit instruction course said that they really weren't comfortable with the IEP process. They didn't feel like they knew enough about it and they were they were nervous about um, getting into the teaching field and not being prepared um, when it comes to IEPs. And it's such an important topic. So I wanted to offer some of this information out um, and I'm glad that you all are taking advantage of it. Um, so this is about IEPs. Um, this is um, pretty basic information and um, and and it's all, all backed by research or the law. Um, and then if you have any questions, you can enter them in the chat and I'll take a look at those at the end, but there'll also be time at the end where you can ask questions um, related to anything that I'm talking about. Um, okay, so what are we talking about tonight? Um, I'm going to first by saying simply what an IEP is and then how a student qualifies for an IEP, how you write the IEP, how to write the goals for the IEP, um, how to determine if the child is on track to meeting those goals. And then um, I have a little bit based on a conference that I had went to um, with some absolute experts in the field on IEP law. And they had some helpful tips about um, how COVID-19 is affecting IEPs and what you guys can do when you get um, back into the schools um, to help along that process. Okay, so what is an IEP? It's an individualized education program and it is, um, it's a legal document and the protections are mandated by law. And these laws um, were the Education for All Handicapped Children, which was um, 1975. And later it was amended several times. It was re renamed the Individuals with Disabilities Act or um, Individuals with Disabilities Improvement Act. So you'll hear it as IDEA or IDEIA. Um, and that was in 2004. And so what these laws protect is that um, every student is receives a free and appropriate public education. So each eligible student with a disability, so one whose disability is adversely affecting their um, school performance, they're entitled to this free and appropriate public education. It's individualized and it's supposed to meet their unique needs and it's provided through their IEP. The Also, they are to be educated in in the least restrictive environment. And so that means that to the greatest extent possible, the student with the disability is to be educated alongside peers without disabilities in the gen ed setting. And I'll talk about this um, very important part a little bit later. There is an IEP for every student with a disability. Schools must specify long and short term goals for the IEP based on a very comprehensive assessment and the data from that assessment. And this data must be collected so that IEP team members can create a comprehensive IEP, one that's covering all the unique needs of that individual child. And um, in that IEP, they also have to specify whether or not the student's going to take assessments with or without accommodations. And again, I'm going to talk more about accommodations in just a little bit. Um, also due process rights. So um, when a decision affecting identification, evaluation, or placement of a student with disabilities is to be made, the student's parents or guardians have to be given the opportunity to be heard, and they have the right to an impartial due process to resolve any conflicting opinions. Um, I had many cases that were coming from previous years. So, um, you know, they had open lawsuits with the school district or the school when I was a teacher. And I had, um, they were coming from first grade in my second grade classroom and the lawsuit was already open. And so, you know, there was nothing that I had done incorrectly at that point, um, but it, it is they're right and it does make you a little nervous as a teacher but as long as you are doing the best that you know how to for that child you'll be you'll be just fine but the parents do have the right to question anything or um, have any disagreements with the IEP or how their child is being educated um, the laws protect for non-discriminatory evaluation so assessment procedures and activities have to be fair equitable and non-discriminatory and then finally um, 
parental participation. So not only do they have the parents have the due process rights, they are part of the team. They're part of the team to um, fully develop the IEP with the school personnel. Um, and so they're along with the educational professionals, both the gen ed teachers and the special educators. Um, the student can also be a part of it when appropriate. And then other people of the team like therapists or um, school counselors. Um, so that is an IEP. That is the what 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 it um, what it all encompasses and why it's so important. And it's really important to really understand that it is a legal document. Anything in there can be questioned in court. So um, an IEP is made up of the present level of the student's development, their annual goals, accommodations, modifications um their what their special education services are going to look like and then any related services that the team decides that that child needs and then school personnel and parents make up the IEP team as and then you inform it with standardized formal assessments or progress monitoring data okay so how do does this child get an IEP? So it starts in pre-referral. Um, and some schools have a pre-referral process and some schools do not have a pre-referral process. So as a, if you're a general educator, this is the part that you really need to understand. And I'll talk about this in more detail in a second. Um, but a lot of that is going to fall on your shoulders because all of that happens before we even refer the child to special ed. So after the pre-referral comes the formal official referral to special education. And that leads to their evaluation. So um, a, a, a test battery, um, observations of the child, um, and we'll go through this in, in more detail in a bit. So the evaluation determines whether or not the child has an IEP uh, or is whether or not the child is eligible for an IEP, um, whether or not the child has a disability and whether or not that disability is adversely affecting their school performance. If the child is eligible, then you begin to develop the IEP. You implement the IEP. After one year, you go back, you look at the IEP and the team rewrites it and decides whether or not the IEP, um, the goals need to be changed if, the, if it still fits for the child. Um, that happens every year. And then every three years, the child is reevaluated. So they go back through this big, long assessment battery to ensure that they still have a disability that is affecting their performance in school. So every year, a new IEP is developed. And every three years, they have a new reevaluation. And then another IEP is developed. OK, so let's talk about that pre-referral process. So it's very important to know that approximately 40% of all students are going to experience some difficulty in the classroom during their school career. So these are students that don't have disabilities. That's almost half of students are going to have difficulty that they might need some of this pre-referral stuff um, that you can get going so that you can get them help faster. Um, and as I said before, some schools have a process for pre-referrals and some will not. So a lot of this, again, is going to fall on your shoulders. So most of the problems that students are having difficulty with, they can be addressed by general educators. Um, they don't need an IEP, but these are still important steps that you can ask yourself and you can begin to look at um, to determine whether or not you do need to do that formal IEP referral. So, um, you, ref you, you have a child, they're having difficulty, and you refer them to what we call the multidisciplinary team. So really, this is you are, you have a child with a difficulty, and you go to the special education teacher and you say, hey, Johnny's having a lot of problems in my class. These are some concerns that I have with Johnny. So you bring it up, you let start letting people know, you let the special education teacher know, you let the administrator know, um, as soon as you start seeing that difficulty. Um, so this is the initial concern regarding the students, any progress, if their progress has slowed, if there start to be a decline. Um, part of this pre-referral is information gathering, sharing this information with the team um, and having discussions about what's going on, discussions of possible strategies to intervene, implementing and monitoring these new strategies, 
evaluating and making decisions on whether a formal referral needs to be going into place. So again, this is all pre-IEP. This, um, this is all the responsibility really lies on the general educator. So, so let's, I'm gonna talk about each one of these steps. So initial concern, that could be failing grades. They have difficulty comprehending text and that can be in reading and in math. So if you have a student that's really struggling with comprehension um, and you see it in, in math word problems, that's a, that's a good indicator. They have a real lack of motivation um, to just learn or to come to your small group tables, any kind of behavior problems that you're having, non-compliance with request, <clears throat> any social emotional problems. If there's a major life change that can um, cause a lot of difficulties for a student or if they have an illness or they've been in an accident. So any of these things would, would catch your attention. And then for the information gathering. So this is when you start um, collecting and document all of the things you've done to try and help this student. So this is what you're doing in the classroom, um, how you're instructing, what strategies you're using, what materials you've tried. Um, so, you know, this, this is where that differentiation comes in and you've got your whole class, you're doing your whole group, but you have a student that's struggling and good teachers are pulling that student and trying other strategies to see how they can help that student be successful. So all those great things that you're doing with that student, keep a list, document, document what is going on. Um, you wanna have data on the student's skill level, um, any background knowledges or experiences they may have, and then all your um, classroom behavior management techniques. And so um, if you are already collecting data on your students, you already know their skill level and background knowledge, you are gonna save this child time and get them to an IEP faster and get them the support that both of you need because it's also hard on you if you have a student that's really struggling and, and you're trying all these different strategies and nothing's working. So if you're if you're doing these things and you just make a habit of documenting this kind, this kind of um, information on your students that struggle, you're gonna save yourself and this student a lot of stress. Okay, so you've got all the information. And so you take this to the team, you take this to the special education teacher, um, and hopefully your special education teacher is helping you out to, to get the team together um, and, and bring in the parties that, that need to be there um, before the, the formal referral. And so these are your, the concerns that, that, that initially made you think that this child might be eligible for special ed. But we also wanna talk about their strengths um, because strengths can really help in, um, in teaching children and, and focusing on their strengths and using their strengths to support their weaknesses. So you also want to, you know, make sure that you, that you know that as well. And you're not just looking at the doom and gloom of the situation. Um, you want to have kind of a reference of where this student is compared to peers in um, their classroom. Um, the setting or the situation where the concern is, because sometimes it might just be a morning thing that you have with a child. Um, it might just be in the reading, in your reading class. Um, it might be during transitions that you have a behavior issue. So um, you really want to think about where the settings are that you're seeing this behavior of concern. Um, there's that list of um, previously tried strategies or interventions. And then you wanna tell them when, when to come and observe that child so, so that they can see it firsthand. And hopefully that team is gonna be helpful with you and they're going to provide you with some recommendations um, for you to do to, to help the child in the general education classroom. So they might suggest things to change your environment, moving the child um, closer to you or, um, or, or putting them with a peer peer support. They're, they might have suggestions for your classroom management system or some new instructional procedure that you could try with the student or your whole class. Um, and then different things to um, make the tasks more um, inviting for the student to make them, uh, you know, not as, uh, I, don't know, I don't wanna say scary, but not as, um, you know, that they don't want to do it. So this, this is like something like if you give a child a really long worksheet and, you know, they immediately blow up or start tearing it up or, you know, just crossing out numbers, they might ask you to like cut it rows by rows and just hand them half the worksheet at a time. Because sometimes just seeing all those problems just really bug the kid out. Um, so they might ask you to change the demands. And 
just know that, you know, if, if you are getting support in your school and there you have a child that's struggling and they ask you to make these changes or they make these suggestions, try not to take it personally that it's not saying you're a terrible teacher, what you're doing isn't working. They're just saying, try this and see if it helps. Um, because what you're doing probably is working for 90% of your students, but they might know something that works with learners that learn things differently or, um, you know, students that are ADHD or have learning problems. And so they're just there trying to help. So try not to take things personally, give it a shot, um, do it more than one day, try it for, you know, at least a week and see, and see if you see any changes. Um, making those kinds of changes can feel uncomfortable because you really get into your groove as a teacher and someone says, hey, you know, instead of, um, you know, doing your praise statements this way and making it really public, the student seems uncomfortable when you praise publicly. So can you, you know, put a sticker on his desk or a post it? And like that might feel really uncomfortable at first because it changes your groove, but just try it at least a week and see if if you notice any changes. Give it, give it a shot is what what I would ask of you. Um, and then my favorite part, if you've ever taken a course from me right away, I just tell you about my love of data. I think data is the most important tool that a teacher has in their back pocket. So I always say data tells a story. It tells a story of what is happening in your classroom. And so um, there's no such thing as bad data. If you have data on a student and the student is not improving, that doesn't mean that you're, again, it doesn't mean you're a bad teacher. It means that child needs support and it means you need support. So let the data tell the story. You know, you have, if you've been collecting data, that's the best thing for that student because you can already go to the special education teacher and say, hey, look at this. Johnny was doing great. Now he's fallen off. I don't know what to do. And you already have the evidence to say, I need help you need support and this child needs support. So let the data support you and your practices. Because on the other hand, when you are collecting data and you do try something new and all of a sudden you see the data go up, there is no better feeling than when data increase and that is because of your instructional changes. Um, so get in the habit of collecting data um, right away, get a system down. I talk about this a lot in my assessment course um, that hopefully um, you guys are all taking or have taken um, or will be taking, um, but data is your friend. Um, don't shy away from it. I could talk this whole lecture about data, but collect it, keep it, look at it frequently. Okay. And then finally, with all the data, with all this information you have, with you've tried all these strategies, you come back to the team in a, you know, a month or so and you say, listen, I've done this. I, I took your advice. Let's talk about what's going on. So you, you ask these questions. Is the student now making progress? Can you fade some of these supports? So maybe the student's starting to make, make progress, but the things that you're doing in their classroom to get that progress is above and beyond what you can do to support that child. So can you fade it back? Are they going to just like flatline again? So that's an important consideration because if you are doing all these things and it's just not sustainable for you as a teacher, that's important for the team to know too. Um, so does it need to be sustained for success? Are these sustained supports practical for carrying out the plan that kind of hits on all that? Um, is the student not making the progress? Does the strategy need to be modified? So they might tell you to go back and try something else. Um, hopefully not. Hopefully you've tried a bunch of things and, and, and you can move that student forward. Um, and so then you decide, should you initiate a formal referral process for special education? And if the answer is yes, then that is when the actual IEP process starts. So everything I talked about, that is all pre-referral. That is all best practices, things that happen in the classroom. And some schools are going to have that in place and some schools aren't going to have that in place. So it's really up to you to do all that information gathering. Okay, so we're in the IEP process now. You have a referral. And so this can be made by the teacher, but a referral can also be started if a parent says, hey, Johnny's having a lot of trouble and I, I would like him to be evaluated for special education. And as soon as a parent says that, it starts a 90 day clock from the time that a referral is put in by either a parent or somebody in the school. It could be an administrator, it could be the gym teacher that 90 day clock begins. And this 
is that you have 90 days to evaluate and to fully develop an IEP. And that is 90 calendar days. That is not 90 school days. Um, and, and so that goes really fast. That's three months to do a whole lot of work. Um, so again, if you already have all this information and data collected, it's going to ease the process along and you're not going to be super stressed during those 90 days while you're doing all this other stuff that teachers have to do, like keep the other 25 kids, kids going and progressing. Um, before the evaluation, the parent has to have informed consent and some days time, sometimes this will start to clog up. So if a teacher thinks a child is eligible, you have to get the consent from the parent and you might send home five or six consent letters and call them a bunch of times before they send it back. And that's into your 90 day clock. Um, so these are all important considerations to have. Um, this is both you and a general education teacher and a special education teacher. Okay, so the referral happened. You now have to evaluate the child. So this does not fall on a teacher. Um, some states and some districts, the special education teacher might be giving some of these assessments, but most of the time there's a diagnostician, um, educational diagnostician or the school psychologist will be giving these assessments. But as the teacher, you will be informing what areas what academic and behavioral and functional areas that you have concerns. Um, so that can help them really pinpoint what assessments they're actually going to be given. Um, so this is really the foundation that the IEP is built. This is how you come up with, um, you know, what disability category they're in. Um, and so it's, it's an important, important part of this. And then this evaluation has to occur within 60 days of that parent consent, but that's still within that 90 day window. Um, okay, so they've done the evaluation. They're gonna determine if the child is eligible. Um, the results are reviewed and you decide, does the child have a disability? If they do, that still doesn't mean they automatically get an IEP. The disability has to affect the child's overall academic or their functional performance in order to receive special education. So um, there are students that have learning disabilities and they can function just fine and they're getting C's and B's and that's, that's you know, sometimes considered fine. And they, they, they decide not to do an IEP for this child, but they're just gonna kind of monitor or a child has ADHD, but they're, their academic performance is fine and their behavior is not getting in the way. But a child might be really bright, um, but have some behavior issues that are getting in the way. And so their grades are not reflective of how they do on the evaluation. So this is a team decision. This is nothing you have to decide on your own, um, but it all comes from that evaluation. Okay, so then um, this is another part that um, the general education teachers and special education teacher work together um, to develop the IEP. Most of the time, um, that special education teacher is writing the IEP, the majority of it, um, with help from therapists um, and counselors and other people that are going to have goals on that. So a lot of this responsibility is going to fall on the special education teacher in the development, but that doesn't mean that the general ed teacher can't be a part of it and they should be a part of it, um, especially when it's informing the, the special education teacher on strategies that they've already tried that, that haven't worked or that have worked um, and contributing that data that they're already collecting in their classroom. Um, so in the IEP, you are documenting their academic or their functional needs. You are writing measurable annual goals that are going to be um, able to be um, measured. So that another teacher can pick up the IEP and know exactly what to do with that goal and what it's gonna look like and how to, um, how to administer an assessment to measure that goal. Um, and it's to make sure that the child is on track to gain toward their grade level standards. Um, the IEP also outlines the services and the supports that the child's gonna receive, who's going to provide them, how often they're gonna get them, how long these sessions are gonna go and where that education is gonna take place. Um, it outlines the method and the time, time frame for monitoring the student's progress. And then the 
the mode and the frequency for communicating the progress to the parents. So all of that goes into the IEP. Okay, so let's talk about all these things that are in the IEP. So the first is the present level of development. Again, this is where a gen ed teacher could contribute. Um, this is, when I was a teacher, we called it the PLEP. It was um, the pleasant present level of educational performance. Um, it's been called the PLOP, pleasant level of performance. Now it's called the PLAP. I don't know how to say it, but it's present level of academic achievement and functional performance. So they really just added that functional to include behavior, social skills, communication, independent living, and mobility. And, and it varies from state to state what needs to go in the PLEP. Um, and information for um, all of the identified areas need to be in it. So um, sometimes you will write a PLEP before each goal. Sometimes you'll write a long two or three page paper about where this child is across all the different academic areas. Um, you're describing both academic and functional skills. You're stating the impact that it has on its involvement in the gen ed curriculum. You are documenting where they currently are performing. Um, so that baseline data, we need it. And then this is what is informing the goals that are going to be written and um, what we think is going to be appropriate progress for that student. So this is at minimum, this is what it should include. But you definitely need to include the strengths and the weaknesses. So it's very important that you also include the strengths of the child when you're talking about the present pleasant, present level of development. Um, it, it really is helpful to know what a child can do. It's also you know, helpful for the parents. It's the cream of the cookie when they're, they're reading this and they sit down to an IEP meeting. And if they're reading a whole document that just says everything their child can't do, that is really hard to, to watch a parent do. So putting in strengths and, and talking about what you see that's, that their child can do that's really awesome, really helps them feel seen. And it helps you see the child, the whole child. So here is an example of um, a PLEP, and this is just focused on a reading skill. So, can, and this is one that I wrote for an IEP. Um, so this is this is from one that I that I did before. So Kanaz has strong expressive and receptive language skills and a large vocabulary. There's a strength. As a result, he actively engages in class discussions. His strong communication skills have also earned him many friends. Kanaz has difficulty with decoding, which are at a low second grade level. His grade level equivalent reading score and standardized test is 2.2. Kanaz's parents worry about the effects of his learning disability outside of school. They report Kanaz avoids video or avoids games that involve even a little bit of reading and only wants to eat at restaurants where he has memorized the menu. The fourth grade curriculum involves many independent reading activities. Kanaz's decoding problems affect his performance in the gen ed setting because he cannot independently read items like written instructions, worksheets, or content area text. He's self-conscious about his reading difficulties, and he works hard to hide his reading struggles from his classmates. Kanaz is currently reading 54 words correct per minute on a second grade reading probe, which is slightly higher than the second grade fall benchmark of 50 words per minute. The fourth grade fall benchmark is 95 words per minute on a fourth grade reading probe. So you can really see there, this is setting up for an oral reading fluency goal. You can see that he's reading on a second grade level, a little higher than their benchmark but he needs to be reading on a fourth grade level at 95 words per minute. Um, so that is leading up into an annual goal. And this is, um, again, something I talk about in my assessment course, but it's also, it's just very important. You can write goals for any student, not just in an IEP, and this is the recommended way to do that. So your annual goals tell you the time, the learner, the behavior you're targeting, the level that they need to be tested at, the content area they need to be tested, what material, so like what curriculum you're using, and the criteria, how you know they've met the goal. Here's the example. In one year, Kanaz will read aloud a fourth grade, reading is content, passage from Dibbles or CBM progress monitoring material. So I'm very clear on exactly where, what curriculum, what program I'm using at 75 words in one minute with at least 90% accuracy. So I say how many words he needs to, so he's at 54, we need to get him at 75. Um, this is 
is a realistic goal. So this is a gain of 0.8 words over 25 school, word, school weeks. Um, and so there are standards for um, how to write a realistic or an ambitious goal. Um, you can find this on the IRIS website that is at the bottom of this PowerPoint that I keep saying. Um, the IRIS Resource Center with Vanderbilt University has wonderful, wonderful, wonderful resources. Um, any really question that you have in, in the classroom on how to do a strategy, they have great tutorials and great materials there. So they have a um, place where you can, you can see the ways to do a realistic or ambitious goals. But again, if you're in my assessment course or have ever taken it, it's a big part of that course. Um, and I, I provide provide that text for you. But you can see here that it's it's very clear. A teacher could pick this up and say, okay, I need a Dibbles or CDM passage. And this child needs has one minute. They need to read 75 words and you know 90% accuracy. Um, okay. But do use this formula on the side to write your goals. This is uh, the most clear way so that you can help out the next teacher because an IEP doesn't start, it would be a beautiful, easy world if it started in September and it ended every May and then every September you had a new one go. Nope. You have the child in September, you start the pre-referral process October, November, December, the referral process starts December, January, you get the IEP in February. So the goals go from February to the following February. So then you're writing maybe one or two goals that you have to monitor. But then that next year teacher, the fifth grade teacher is going to pick that up and, and they have to um, measure that, use that same, those same goals. So they have to be very clear on what what it is that you're doing. Cause I've gotten goals before and I'm like, I have no idea how to do this. And then you get, you know, that is on you. And if the parents use those due process rights and and you can't show evidence that, that the child is going toward this goal, especially if it's a bad written goal, that is going to come back on you. So um, it's very important that these goals are really clear and not only do that for yourself, but do it for the teacher next year. The other important thing about this is if you make your goals too easy, then you have to rewrite them. If the child passes them in the middle of the year, you have to get the whole team together and you have to write a new goal and um, new benchmarks. If you make it too hard and the no way the child's going to do get the goal by the end of the year, you have to get the team back together and write a new write a new goal. So it's really important again that you have this data and you know where this child can go. This is extremely hard for a special education teacher that is writing a brand new IEP for a child that they may have never really met. They've never instructed. Um, they've only ever given the, these eligibility things to them. So that's again, general education teacher, be a good friend to your colleagues and have some data and strategies that you've tried so that they can really pinpoint these goals and you can give them the feedback and say, yep, I think this goal is doable. Okay. Um, so then you move into accommodations and modifications. This is also part of the IEP. And an accommodation is a change in the presentation, the setting, how they respond are responding in class, any of the timing or scheduling of a test. Maybe you have a class in the afternoon, but they do better in the morning. So they get to take all their assessments in the morning um, that really give them the best situation possible to best meet their unique needs. So some of these would be like sitting next to a teacher, having extra time, using a keyboard rather than writing answers, um, dictating your answers to a scribe um, if it's not like a spelling assessment or taking a test in a small group. These would all be accommodations. So a modification is a change that alters the measurement of the intended skill. So you're no longer measuring the skill that the assessment sought to measure. Um, so it's highly questionable whether the test res results accurately res represent a student's skill and knowledge. So this would be shorting, shortening the number of test questions or providing different questions to be on the student's reading level. So this makes it kind of like, well, it's reading comprehension, but I am reading all the questions out loud to the student. Well, it's not really reading comprehension anymore. If you're reading them the questions, that's listening comprehension. And listening comprehension and reading comprehension, silent reading comprehension are different. Um, so reading the out loud would be a test modification. And 
it's no longer the skill that you're assessing. So it's giving you data that's that's not really correct. So it, this is a, a little difficult little area and something that teachers that currently are in practice still struggle with. So you always wanna ask yourself, am I measuring the skill differently or am I just adjusting the means or setting with which they're allowed to respond? So if you're measuring the skill differently, it's not an accommodation. If So we always want to try to modify before you accommodate. If you're modifying, you're, you're, you're giving them more support than they may need. So do the accommodations first. And if they need modifications, that's okay. But try for the accommodations first. Okay, um, types of testing accommodations. I'm gonna spend time on the accommodations because again, this is this is where we wanna try and focus um, our supports if we can. Um, modifications are, are, are more for students that, that are gonna really need these, this material to, be, to look different. So the presentation. So if you're using um, any kind of visual equipment, so sometimes um, teachers will do like a yellow, background with black print instead of white on black because it's a little easier for students to see um, the writing on yellow instead of on white. That's an, uh, that's okay. That's an accommodation. If you have large print, if you're using an amplifier for the audio, um, if they have markers so they can keep their place, if you read the directions aloud, that's fine. Um, if you're using sign language or you you are marking the directions, are getting highlighted, so they read the directions. Those are all fine. Um, response, so if a student has the bubble in answers, somebody else can bubble in the answers for the student. Um, that's an accommodation. Um, you, you, for test, things that they're not like being tested on their um, spelling or their, their numbers, like if they have to um, answer computation problems in math, somebody can scribe the numbers for them um, as long as they're not being scored on whether or not the numbers are written correctly. But if they can do all the comprehensions and you're just telling the person, or maybe it's a behavior thing that they just like go nuts when they have to use a pencil, because I've had kids that do that, that, you know, if you can just scribe for them and, and they can show you that they can do the skill, those are, those are fine. Um, if they can record their responses into an audio tape, or use a computer um, or any kind of template, any, anything like that for responding. And then the setting, taking the test alone, taking it in a small group, taking it at home with supervision, um, using adaptive furniture or um, special lighting. Those are all things that you can do. And then again, timing and scheduling, they can take breaks, have that flexible schedule and extra time. Okay, we are still talking about, um, we, we're just talking about developing the IEP. Now we are moving into implementing the IEP. So the team made this IEP, they met, everybody agreed, this is a fantastic IEP. We're gonna sign off on it, let's go. So now you have to implement it. And so again, this falls on both a gen ed and a special education teacher. So in the IEP, it's determined um, what the special education services are going to look like. So um, these are the services that are individually decided um, and how to address these needs with the students in all of these different areas. Um, and it's providing them the more intensive and individualized instruction that is above and beyond what is being typically provided in a special education classroom. And so this is where least restrictive environment comes into. So this refers to the setting where a child with a disability can receive an appropriate education designed to meet his or her educational needs alongside peers without disabilities to the maximum extent appropriate. So how much of their school day can they spend in general education and still be successful? That's where you want the child to be. We don't want to pull students out if they don't need to be pulled out, if they don't need to be in the resource room, then we want to make sure they're with their general education peers as much as possible. And this is um, a really critical part um, in, in how the services are going to be provided. This is also a part that, that due process really can come in, um, you know, when parents aren't happy with how long much their child is pulled out. And, you know, maybe they're getting pulled out into special education and they start missing assemblies and things like that or special parties in the classroom. And, and, and that sometimes can spark a whole due process case because the parents are not happy because their child is not included in these, you know, special 
bonding experiences with their peers. Um, so it's really important that we that we try and make sure that that children that do have IEPs are included as much as possible. Um, so the students should not be removed from the classroom unless their learning cannot be achieved without some of these supplemental supports and services. So this might mean that a special education teacher is being pushed into a gen ed classroom. Um, and sometimes those partnerships can work really well. In an ideal world, all of those partnerships would work really well, um, but sometimes they don't. So if you have an opportunity to do some co-teaching with a special education teacher, I ask that you are open-minded um, and bring them in and, and, and work together um, as a team. I was an inclusive teacher. We I had a co-teaching classroom where I was there all day and half the students had IEPs and half did not. Um, I always call this an arranged marriage. Um, the Jenna teacher and I, we were not besties, um, but we got the job done. We had different belief systems on classroom management, but there was a lot of compromising to go on. Um, and we we really did a, a good, I think we did a good job um, at the end of the day, even though there were a big differences in the way that we taught, um, we, we worked together to best meet the needs of our students. So go in with an open mind, have your safe people that you can vent to um, if you're having trouble, but continue to be an open mind because it's for the students. Um, and, and give a little and take a little um, when it comes to those relationships. Okay, least restrictive environment, back on that. Um, so you start and you wanna start in gen general education and say, can the child be in the general education classroom? And if not, then you start to consider special education. So do they need to be in a resource room and be pulled out? Does the special education teacher need to push into the gen ed classroom? Um, does the child need one-on-one? -on -one support um, type of things. If the needs cannot be met in a special education classroom, then maybe there, there might be a reason for them to go to a special school or maybe they need homebound instruction. I've also been a homebound teacher for students that were, their behavior was too dangerous to be at school. Those are some really interesting settings um, to be a teacher in, but really important that these children still get their the services that they need and they still still receive their academics. And then finally, do, do they need to be in a hospital or a residential facility? Um, so that would be the most restrictive. Those are the more rare cases. But again, we want to start in in gen ed. And these placement options, these are these are fluid. So a student might receive some services in one setting and other services in another. And we're talking about least restrictive environment. We're talking the entire school day. So in the IEP, there's actual minutes where every minute of the child's day is accounted for. So they, you know, you'll hear like, oh, Johnny's in gen ed 80% of the time. Well, that includes his recess time, his lunch time, his you know, music specials, gym specials, but he might be pulled out for reading and math and writing. And then he joins back his class in science and social studies. So it could be, you know, there's a lot of different options that can be talked about. And so you want to find all the options that the child can be included with his peers. Um, again, they're fluid because they're going to, they might change over time. It, you know, Johnny might start out with a push-in teacher but then need more support later on or maybe he has a lot of support he's being really successful so the decisions made for him to have more push-in support in the gen ed classroom um, and then these decisions for least restrictive environment a big no-no that sometimes sadly is seen is that these decisions are made by their disability category and that is absolutely not correct or not the law. They're individualized. So just because a student has a behavior disorder does not mean they have to go to a behavior classroom. Um, each individual child, this decision needs to be made for that individual child. If you ever see anything like that, do not be afraid to stand up for that child um, and say something. Um, okay, so then you also have related services. So the IEP team decides whether or not they need extra things like do you need to consider transportation or um, counseling, speech language, OT, PT, um, social work, or any anything with the nurse? Sometimes the nurse needs to be on the IEP because they're taking medicine at school and that needs to be included as well because that counts for minutes of the day that they're out of the classroom. How are they going to get there? When are they getting back? All of that needs to be accounted for. Um, if they're getting some of these services like OT, PT, or speech, 
they're getting it one or more times for short periods of time, usually 15 to 30 minutes. Um, you can have all these services, none of these services. Again, it's based on their individual needs and not the availability of the service. So if a child needs a school counselor, that child gets a school counselor, even if this, there's no school counselor on record for that school. And again, this is where due process will come in. When parents want a behavior therapist and there's no behavior therapist at the school, then they might start the due process if the school doesn't put in the IEP or they don't have the, the school doesn't budget. Anything that's written in that IEP by law has to be met. So if they say that they're gonna get you know, a translator, then it, the school has to pay for a translator. So sometimes schools, even if a child needs it, sadly, they might push back and say, no, we don't think this child needs it because they don't have $50,000 to hire another personnel in the school or the district. And that's again, where due process will come in. So um, it's very important. If the child needs it, the child needs it. So um, th those are important decisions that need to be made by the whole team. Also, if a child doesn't need it, sometimes parents will push for these things and the child doesn't need it and the school has to stand up to the parent. So it goes both ways. So these litigations are no fun for anybody. So it's very important, again, that we have this all this data. We're basing our decisions on data so we can say yes to the parents. They need this or no, they don't need this and this is why. And that's where we come into data. Progress monitoring, the annual review. So this data is going on the whole time, but it's most important at the annual review that you can say whether or not the child has met the goal. Um, states differ on this. Sometimes they have three benchmarks. Sometimes they have four that you have to um, document how, what the progress that they're making. Um, progress monitoring data, big part of my assessment course. This is that formative assessment that you are doing weekly. If you have a student with a disability, you should probably do, be doing progress monitoring weekly or as close to weekly as possible in most of the areas on their IEP. Um, that makes sense. You're not doing the progress monitoring for all goals on the IEP, but if there's a reading goal, you should be doing ORF. If there's a math goal, you should be doing some kind of um, computation so that you have data that they're on track. Um, CBM, curriculum-based measurement, is the best way, the best kind of progress monitoring to use because it's standardized. Um, a lot of schools already have CBMs that they either subscribe to, but there's a bunch that are free. In my assessment course, I talk about this at great length, um, but um, at least bi-weekly, um, four benchmarks is usually the case. Don't just collect the data, but actually plot it and make a line graph. Because if you're just looking at scores, sometimes that tells you nothing. But as soon as you see that visual, you're like, oh my gosh, look at that huge dip that happened. Um, oh, it happened right around the holidays. I wonder if that has something to do with it. So plotting the data is a huge important part of collecting the data. You just don't collect it. You plot it. You look at it. You think about it. Does this make sense? And then um, new or should have known. So this is when... Um, this was this is something new to me um, when I, I had a recent conference and I got to listen to um, David Yateman and oh I forget his first name but it's Yell Dr Yell and they are like the top law researchers and are on umpteen million litigations a year um, it, with the parents advising parents or advising school districts. And what really comes down to it, when did you know or should have known this child was not making their goals? So that is why you have to have the data is so that you should, when is it that you should have known that this child was struggling or that you knew this child was struggling and didn't do anything? Um, that is what the, the lawsuits come down to. So that should be a big um light going off like, okay, yeah, this data stuff sounds kind of important. Okay, so easy, quick little data, plot the average baseline data point, plot the goal based on those realistic or ambitious outcomes, draw a line from baseline to the goal. And you're collecting data and you're monitoring that trend line um, through their progress points. You're going to use the points below method, which if there's three points above, below, or on the trend line, you need to make a change. Or if they're above the trend line, you probably need to make a harder goal. If it's below, three points are below the trend line, then you need to make an easier goal. If it's on the trend line, you're good. You made a really great goal. 
or the slope method, you can look at the slope. Does the trend line match the slope of, of the graph? And you can do that in Excel. Um, and I'm happy to talk to anybody about this. I can talk about data all the time. So just shoot me an email. OK, so um, kind of closing up here. Um, COVID-19 has greatly affected IEPs. Um, evaluations have been delayed for many students because um, teachers and school personnel have not been able to administer testing to students. Students and case managers um, really need to document all efforts that they're using to communicate with the parents. So during COVID, that would be a great suggestion. Hopefully, I'm hoping that we're at the end of this and um, things start clearing up. But if you are a part of any of this, that just documenting all your efforts to communicate with parents is going to be really helpful um, to show, you know, that, that you're trying. Um, develop a system of communication, be really specific. If you don't write it down, it doesn't count. So if you say, you know, if you know you called the parent two weeks ago and then you called them again the following Friday, but you're not writing this down, it, it doesn't count. So you have to write down, you have to keep a phone log, you have to keep an email log of how you're um, communicating with the parents. Um, when we have in-person instruction returning and all systems are go, um, IEP teams are going to have to meet to really assess where the student is on track because if many of you guys know that the students are sometimes not showing up to this virtual learning and things are a mess and students are going to be behind and and we all got to work together to get them back. So um, all these IEP teams are going to have to meet. There's going to be many, many revisions to ensure that schools are getting their free and appropriate public education. Um, and so currently, to the best of the abilities, teachers should really be trying to provide these accommodations and services through learning, virtual learning and teletherapy as much as possible. Um, but doing the best that you can is, is, is all that we can really ask. Okay, so I just want to end on these things. Um, I hope a lot of the points that I said are going to stick out to you. But just remember that this is a legal contract. So anything that's in there, you have to provide. So if there's something that the IEP team wrote and you don't like doing it, I'm sorry, you have to do it. Um, if a parent finds out you're not doing it, you, that could be big trouble for you. Um, so, so make sure when you get an IEP, if you have a student with an IEP, you read that IEP from front to back and you make sure you're doing all the things that are in it. Um, that pre-referral process I talked about at the beginning is one of the most important parts that I just want to stress the teachers because, you know, I've had students that when I was in that co-teaching situation, they got into our classroom, they were in fourth grade and they did not know their letter sounds and they didn't have an IEP. And I just couldn't believe that they had gotten all the way through this school to fourth grade and had not gotten an IEP yet. And the teachers said that, oh, I started it in the pre-referral in December last year, and they had to start the data in the December the year before, and then the school year ended, and they never got the to the formal referral part, and this had been happening in the second grade year and his third grade year, and then he got to us, and it, he still didn't know anything, and it, it, it just breaks your heart. So if you're already doing all that pre-referral stuff all the time, then you are going to save that child from getting to fourth grade without knowing their letters. So if you can do it, if you can keep these practices of documenting and communicating um, and, and collecting that data, then, then you are going to save that time. And then, you know, I, I know a lot of this, you know, I'm like, you have to do this, it's the law, but just do what we call good faith efforts. If you're doing the best that you know how, then you have nothing to worry about. Um, you know, don't, especially, like when I would get those litigations, like they, you know, I knew what I was doing was the best that I knew how it was what I learned when I was at university myself. And, and, and so I was not trying to do anything to harm that child or, or not help that child make progress. So we call these good faith efforts. If you are doing the best that you can, then, then you don't have no problems. You don't need to worry about being sued. Um, document communicate, collect data. Those are the top three things um, that if you take away anything, do those things, it's going to improve your teaching. Um, if you want to learn more um, about special education, there's a new course that we started last this last year, Special Education Literacy. I would love to talk 
more about these kinds of things and the strategies that you can use in your classroom to help kids read. That's really my area of expertise. So um, that's a course um, that I want to let you guys know that's there. But also um, our special education program, we are we have great opportunities for, for master's degrees. So we have the UTG program, that's undergrad to grad program. You can get an undergraduate and master's degree in five years with a special education endorsement. Um, or um, the SB2 is a master's in special education or an EDS in school psych. Um, and that's a fully funded program. So if you have any interest in learning more about students with disabilities, come on and learn with us um, in, in the SPED department. And that is it. So um, thank you again for taking the time to do this for your future students. Um, they'll appreciate you for it. Um, you can connect with me, email me, I'm here um, for, for any, anything that you need. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you can unmute, or if you're more comfortable throwing in a chat box, I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. Okay, well, thanks, um, everyone, and I again appreciate it and have a, a great evening. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Lisa. Yeah, we'll see you around. Okay. All right, take care. Bye. Bye-bye.